Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week we again speak with Dawn Chapman, a just mom of North St. Louis who's been battling for some justice for those families whose health and lives have been negatively impacted by the World War II radioactive nuclear weapons waste illegally buried at the adjacent Westlake landfill. She reports on her recent trip to D.C. to speak with representatives of the White House and for an unexpected and long-awaited face-to-face meeting with Gina McCarthy, head of the Environmental Protection Agency. This after more than a year of trying to get to her. You're going to want to hear this one, as it includes the best, funniest, if not most pathetic insights into the EPA management that you will ever encounter. Plus, our popular Numbnuts of the Week feature, Nuclear Reactor Duck! and cover report, and more honest nuclear information than CNN will ever put on the air. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, April 12, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Starting off in Japan, where in the wake of the March 11, 5th anniversary of the start of that nuclear disaster, There are still many articles and reports coming out. In an interview with nuclear engineer Hiroake Kuide, who's also a former interviewee of Nuclear Hot Seat, he said, Radioactive material has been dispersed, contaminating Tohoku, Kanto, which is the Tokyo area, and western Japan. The law says that absolutely nothing may be removed from a radioactive management area in which the levels exceed 40,000 becquerels per square meter. So how much area has been contaminated beyond 40,000 becquerels per square meter? The answer to that is 140,000 kilometers, or over 54,000 square miles. While centered on Fukushima, parts of Chiba and Tokyo have also been contaminated. The number of people living in what must be called a radiation-controlled area could exceed 10 million. I believe the government has the responsibility to evacuate these entire communities, but the government decided to leave them exposed to the real danger of radiation. In my view, Fukushima should be declared uninhabitable, but if that were to be done, it would likely bankrupt the country. They've decided to sacrifice people. In my view... This is a serious crime committed by Japan's ruling elite. Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Energy Education and one of our leading experts is just back from a month in Japan where he toured many of the areas in and around Fukushima Prefecture. He said, We had numerous doctors say that they were going to lose hospital privileges and things like that. If they spoke of radiation damage or anything about Fukushima in relationship to people's complaints. And the people that are keeping track of deaths in Fukushima Prefecture aren't publishing the data. So the entire government infrastructure, from the people in Tokyo to the underlings in the prefecture, are all singing the same song. That this is stress, there's no radiation. And it sure isn't what I found, I'll tell you, Arnie said. He spoke of a woman who he met in one of the resettlement areas who's considered the unofficial mayor of this group. He said she experienced hair loss, bloody nose, speckles on her skin, and the doctors told her it was stress, not to worry about it. That's not stress. It was radiation damage. But again, that's this inhumanity that I was experiencing. Every time I turned around, I saw people that definitely experienced radiation damage. There are numerous podcasts and transcripts and links to interviews up on their website, fairwinds.com, and that's F-A-I-R-E-W-I-N-D-S dot com. 
Reinforcing Hiroake Kuwide's claims of contamination going as far as Chiba Prefecture from Fukushima, a report was released on March 23rd of this year that the government of Chiba announced that 333 of 522 children who were tested were diagnosed as A2 through C on their thyroid test. This refers to the size and the advancement of cysts growing on their thyroids, an early sign of exposure to radiation and a possible precursor of thyroid cancer. A2 refers to cysts smaller than 5.1 millimeters or nodules smaller than 20.1 millimeters, and 306 children were in that category. Eleven were categorized as B, which is a cyst larger than 5.1 millimeters or a nodule larger than 20.1 millimeters, and 16 were categorized as C, which meant that follow-up tests were required. Chiba Prefecture, which is at the door of Tokyo, is only 221 kilometers or 177 miles away from Fukushima Daiichi. And the findings in the children make it clear that the radioactivity spread significantly to that area. A new article has been published just today by Joseph Mangano and Dr. Jeanette Sherman of Radiation and Public Health Project talking about health researchers turning a blind eye to casualties five years after Fukushima began. According to the authors of this report, according to the authors of this report, when asked how many casualties occurred from the 2011 disaster, public health leaders in Japan have addressed the topic with ignorance and deception. A search of the medical literature shows only two studies in Japan that review actual changes in disease and death rates. One showed that 127 Fukushima-area children have developed thyroid cancer since the meltdown. A typical number of cases for a similarly sized population of children would be about 5 to 10. The other study showed a number of ectopic intrathyroidal problems in local children, a disorder that is extremely rare. No other studies looking at the changes in infant deaths, premature births, child cancers, or other radiation-sensitive diseases are available. But the literature also shows that researchers have been pouring out articles on mental health and psychological impacts on local residents. Journals from Japan and other nations have printed research on stress, behavioral changes, fears, and even changes in average blood pressure, blaming it on concerns about the meltdown. We'll have a link to this article up on the website, NuclearHotSeat.com under this episode, number 251. So what is the current condition at Fukushima? In another interview with Arnie Gunderson, he said, Massive amounts of radiation continue to enter Japan's water and air and the Pacific Ocean daily. Due to its triple meltdowns and the unmitigatable radioactive releases, Fukushima Daiichi will continue to bleed radiation into the Pacific Ocean for more than a century. He went on to say, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution is measuring 1,000 miles offshore of the U.S. West Coast and picking up 10 backrolls per cubic meter. At my point, that's when my alarm bells go off. 10. That plume is still coming. The Pacific is a huge place, and to think that a disaster on the opposite side of the world can be detected and begin to contaminate California... I think that the monumental shattering conclusion is radiation knows no borders. What you can be sure of is that somebody's going to die from the radiation that's in the Pacific, but you just won't know who it is, and they're counting on that. And the entire mountain range that runs 100 miles up and down this coast in Japan is also contaminated, and as much radiation is pouring out into the Pacific from the mountain range because it's so contaminated as from the Fukushima site. What we're finding in the Pacific is that with the biggest body of water on the planet, you can't dilute this stuff. And we're going to begin to see this bioaccumulation, which is all the fish that are in the ocean are going to uptake the cesium and the strontium and become more and more and more radioactive. So what's Tokyo Electric Power, TEPCO, doing about this?
this nuclear site that they were in charge of and that has been so catastrophic. Right now, they're thinking about and planning to dump tritium-contaminated water, radioactive water from the site, into the ever more radiologically polluted Pacific Ocean. Tritium is almost impossible to remove from the huge quantities of water used to cool the melted-down reactors at the Fukushima Daiichi plant. And the water is accumulating at the rate of 300 tons a day. Some of it is already leaking into the Pacific Ocean, and TEPCO is looking at it, the government is looking at it and going, eh, in for a penny, in for a pound. Let's get rid of this stuff. Here's hoping that they don't. Please, don't do it. Don't even think of it. Tritium goes directly into soft tissues and organs of the human body, potentially increasing the risks of cancer and other illnesses. Over to the U.S., where the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in Carlsbad, New Mexico, or WIP site, is still in a one-month safety pause, even though the officials there are under severe national pressure to open the site by the end of this year, ready or not, in order to accept radioactive waste, plutonium waste, from other countries. Rebecca Moss of the Santa Fe New Mexican has written a superb article laying out both the history of WIP and the current dilemmas that it faces. She points out that when the salt bed trenches were mined on the outskirts of Carlsbad in the mid-1980s, Congress dictated specific guidelines for what could be held within its chambers and determined that only low-level transuranic waste, meaning rags, tools, and even soil that had been contaminated with potent radiation through the creation and testing of nuclear weapons in the U.S., could fill the 6.2 million cubic foot cavern more than 2,000 feet below the ground. But in the 17 years since the facility opened, the nation's nuclear landscape has changed, and WIP remains the world's only underground geological repository for nuclear waste. The confluence, and I love a reporter who has a vocabulary and isn't afraid to use it, the confluence of budget constraints, geopolitical issues, the threat of terrorists obtaining nuclear materials, and other concerns have led many to consider whether WIP's mission should be expanded to include not only higher levels of waste from the U.S., but also waste from around the world, with plans already in motion to accept plutonium from Japan. This despite the fact that WIP experienced two separate accidents in February of 2014, the second on Valentine's Day, when a 55-gallon drum of waste from Los Alamos National Laboratory exploded, spewing americium and plutonium that contaminated not only underground, but went up a ventilation shaft and contaminated the air and the surrounding area. The facility has been closed since that time. The link to this article will be on the website. You've got to read it. The woman is brilliant, and she really makes all the issues clear. And now for our duck <laughs> and cover report. At the Browns Ferry Nuclear Power Plant in Alabama, on April 6th, high radiation levels were detected in a main steam line at the newest reactor. Actually, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission labeled it a high, high radiation condition, which was either a typographical error or a Freudian slip. <coughs> At the Palo Verde nuclear facility in Arizona on April 11, leakage was discovered in a piping instrument nozzle for the reactor coolant system, which represents a degradation of a principal safety barrier. <coughs> And at Nuclear Slumlord Entergy's Waterford 3 nuclear plant in Louisiana, even though contractors falsified fire inspection records for almost a year, the Nuclear Rubber Stamp uh, Regulatory Commission said it won't issue a violation notice or a civil penalty for the faked inspections, despite the fact that officials could face criminal prosecution and fines. Yeah, gotta hand it to the NRC. And obviously, somebody did. <laughs> Terrific article we will link to in the examiner.com by Byron DeLear on the Westlake landfill and how the EPA has taken half measures to save face. We'll have more on Westlake during today's featured interview.
In Scotland, beaches near the Dun Ray nuclear power site will continue to be monitored for radiological contamination as sand-sized fragments of irradiated nuclear fuel were flushed into the sea from the site in the 1960s and 70s. Hundreds of the fragments have been found and removed from the beaches over the years, but that's reduced the number of particles that came to rest there, not eliminated them. And now... Nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, nuclear hot seat, none that's out of week. French Energy Minister Ségolène Royal must have a truly passive-aggressive relationship to Tesla founder Elon Musk because she has suggested that he build an electric car factory on the site of France's oldest nuclear power reactor after it closes at the end of the year. Now, what better thing to do with a dirty old nuke site than to build a clean, green electric vehicle factory right on top of its remains? Of course, no word about decommissioning, decontamination, the period of time it's going to take. None of that is important. What's truly important is she just wants it there. Now, French President Francois Hollande has pledged to close down the Fesselheim nuclear plant in the Alsace region near the German border, but has met strong resistance from local politicians and unions worried about job losses. Royal said at a briefing, according to a news agency, the main problem is the site's transformation. We need to give hope to this community. My idea is to bring a Tesla factory. The outspoken minister, who seems way out of touch with reality when it comes to nuclear issues, said she had mentioned the idea to Musk himself and would be seeing Tesla's management in 10 days. This was on Tuesday, the 5th of April, so sometime this week they are supposed to meet. She told reporters, I said to him, I have a place for you, Fesselheim. He didn't say no. Who dares wins. Royal's staff did not return a request from Reuters for comment. But he's not a dumb man. He's actually the definition of not a dumb man. So it's highly unlikely you'll get what you're going after, Segalin, Royal, And that's why you, yes you, Minister of Energy in France, are this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that's out of week. We'll have the week's featured interview in just a moment. But first, Nuclear Hot Seat is listener-supported and relies on your donations to keep us growing upward and outward to infinity and beyond. We have monthly running expenses, website assistance, travel expenses when there's an important story that I need to get to so it's covered. So whatever you can do to help us meet these goals and so many others that I'm still dreaming of, please do what you can. One suggestion is to make what I call the Starbucks donation. Send the equivalent of what you would pay for a cup of coffee to Nuclear Hot Seat. You can do it as a one-shot. You can do it as an ongoing. And it's the best cup of coffee I will never drink. To donate, go to NuclearHotSeat.com, click on the big red Donate button, and know that whatever amount you can offer is deeply appreciated. As always, you have my gratitude. In North St. Louis, the Westlake landfill continues to cause concern, and it's not going to stop anytime soon. This site contains between 43,000 and 48,000 tons of World War II-era highly radioactive nuclear weapons manufacturing waste. It was illegally buried there in a floodplain of the Missouri River back in the 1970s. And now... With a five-year-old underground fire that can't be put out, advancing on it from the adjacent Bridgeton landfill, this is a problem that needs to be solved. The landfill has been invisibly poisoning residents for over 40 years, resulting in cancer clusters, brain tumors in children, autoimmune diseases, and much more. Dawn Chapman is a resident of North St. Louis who had no idea that the house she and her husband were about to buy a little over 10 years ago was only a few miles away from Westlake. 
which is a Superfund site. Dawn is a self-described mom fighting for the safety of my family and my community. And she, along with Karen Nickel, serve as admins for the Westlake Landfill Facebook page, which is ground zero for information about the issues. An activist on these issues since about three years ago, when she first discovered what she was living next to, Dawn recently returned, along with Karen, from a whirlwind trip to Washington, D.C., to take some meetings with high-level government officials. This is her uncensored response to that trip, the lead-up to it, and its aftermath, recorded shortly after her return. Note that when she refers to Lacey, she means Representative Lacey Clay of St. Louis, a co-sponsor of House Bill 4100, which is meant to take remediation of the Westlake site away from the Environmental Protection Agency, which has basically punted it for the last 27 years, and put it into the hands of the much more experienced and capable Army Corps of Engineers. Don Chapman, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. Oh, thanks for having me, Libby, again. Last week, you had two monumental meetings, but let's roll it back a little bit before then. How long have you been trying to get a meeting either with the White House or with Gina McCarthy, who's the head of the Environmental Protection Agency? We've been trying to get a meeting with Gina McCarthy, the head of the Environmental Protection Agency, for the better part of a year. And in fact, we were successful about this time last year, maybe a little bit earlier in getting a bipartisan letter signed by our senators and their Congress folk sent to her requesting that she meet with us. So that went out and we took a trip to D.C. and we were turned away. With the White House meeting, we did not even know that this was possible to even get a meeting with these folks, that they even existed and who they were until doing a little bit of research. Then once we found out who we were, We honestly didn't think that we stood a chance. We thought, you know, these people are so high up. They're above EPA. You know, they're not going to give us the time of day. So we thought, well, we'll just try. And lo and behold, they were very eager. And tell us who these people are and what the agency is or what their standing is above the EPA. So this is the Council for Environmental Quality. They go by CEQ, and they are an arm of the White House, and they brief uh, the president and the cabinet on environmental issues. You know, they deal with sites, issues, spills, I mean, you name it. Just about everything environmental falls under their arms. But they try not to intrude unless it becomes clear that things are going awry with an issue and somebody needs to, potentially the president or whoever needs to step in. How did you get this meeting? Who was it who arranged it? Did they call you? Did somebody within Missouri government contact them? Lois Gibbs was the one to reach out to the um, Council on Environmental Quality. She had figured out who they were and thought, you know, this is an option we can try. And she said, you know, I can put out an email and whatnot. She said, you guys could do it or I could do it. We were like, you do it and copy us in. We'll just kind of do it together. She sent them some articles that had come out in the press and a little bit of information. And then they responded back that they would like to see us. It took us about a month to get there because, you know, it's hard for moms to just drop everything and travel. (laughs) It's really a hard, a hard thing to get the schedules worked out. And so when we locked down the meeting and we had bought the tickets, we, we weren't even able to stay in a hotel. We had to stay with Lois Gibbs at her house and have her pick us up because we couldn't waste taxi money and we just could not, Karen and I, afford a hotel at this point. So yeah. when we were sitting at the airport... Karen said, you know, I think, let's call Gina. Let's call Gina McCarthy. We're going to be in town with CEQ. We've got a little opening in the middle of the day. You know, do you think she'll agree to it? (laughs) And so she called, and um, they put us through. It all happened very quickly, the meeting with Gina. I'm fascinated by how this got through to Gina McCarthy after all this time and so quickly. Did Karen say that you already had this White House meeting planned and while you were there you'd like to stop by? Or was the EPA and Gina's office already aware that you were having this meeting? Do you know it all? 
Yes, we did find out, but only after the meeting with Tina. We had figured that they had gotten wind that we were going to meet with the White House. And we had also figured that there had been a Flint hearing. And it was very easy to tell at that hearing that one day they were Democrats and everybody were really kind of beating up on EPA. And then the next day, the Democrats were going after the governor, Governor Schneider. So it was made clear to us that a brief in the hallway meeting took place between Congressman Clay and Gina. And he told her, he said, you know, you, you guys, your agency's in a lot of trouble. And we've got this legislation and you have got to start offering up some good faith here regardless of what happens with this legislation to transfer the site. And he said, you know, you won't even meet with two moms. And she agreed to it, but her staff was vehemently against it. Said, no, 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 no meeting with the moms, no. But Gina was all right with it. And so we heard back from Clay's office. He said, you know, we tried, and this is the response. He said, you know, but she wasn't against it. You know, her staff was not happy about it. Do you know why they were so against it? You know, we don't. The only thing that we were told that she told him was, you know, we don't want the moms to yell at us. <laughs> I'm, sorry. Know, I'm sorry. That, that was funny. I, I, I was I'm sorry. Funny. sorry. That was, that's just so adolescent. They don't want the moms yelling at them. Karen and I just looked at each other, Levy. We were like, are you kidding me? Of all the things going wrong in this country, that EPA is over all these sites, Flint, Animus, Westlake, She's worried about two moms from St. Louis yelling at her. Like that to me was just so silly and out of left field. And I just, I I was kind of insulted by it. You know, I'm like, she doesn't want us to yell at her. So getting back to the chronology of the meetings, who was supposed to be there and how did you prepare for them? Obviously, we didn't know until late the night that we arrived that we were okayed with a meeting for Gina McCarthy, and we were told we only had 20 minutes. The meeting was supposed to be at 1230. Our meeting with the White House the next day was at 3. So we knew that you know, we had been prepping for the meeting with the White House and the CEQ meeting. So this threw us just inside of a tornado because we had another moment to prepare. So we were literally sitting in our pajamas on Lois Gibbs' couch in her front room with her role-playing, pretending to be Gina McCarthy, I mean, just, I mean, it was just the most stressful, hardest thing that I think I've ever been through. And what was the essence of what you were led to expect was going to be coming at you from Gina? Well, there were two. Either she's going to be very angry, we've been a a thorn in her side, she's going to be snippy, or she's going to come at it and be very nice and say, okay, what can we do? How can we make you guys go away? And either way, we knew that she was going to want something. She would want something to do. You know, what can we do? And, you know, my God, when it comes to Westlake, we could give a list of things that need to be done at this site. There's no shortage of what needs to happen. The problem is, is that all those are minor and they already know. So we went for, you know, we chose to focus instead of on the dirt and the soil to focus on the people. We said, you know, she's not going to see that coming. And frankly, people are the most important part of what's happening. You know, we're not talking about mistakes about soil and levels of uranium. We need to talk about people and what it's like to live next to this site. What's it like when the school district sends you home a note with your child telling you that they may have to keep your child overnight and shelter them in place if an emergency happens? You know, that sort of thing. What's it like to hang up Christmas lights and go in and have to put a gas mask on while you're hanging up your Christmas lights? That's the sort of thing that we focused on. How did she respond, and what, if anything, solid came out of that meeting? She was really taken aback. I have to tell you, that building that she's in is like a dungeon, Levy. I mean, it was the darkest, dankest environment I think I'd ever been in, even just walking in D.C. And the look on her face when we walked in... She looked very scared. Let me just say it that way. She looked exhausted. She was standing there, and there was only one other person. It looked like maybe a lawyer or a secretary, some guy. And so it was just her and this other guy and then Karen and myself. And she just looked really exhausted to me. I mean, I I thought she kind of maybe be smug. I mean, I didn't know what to expect. But she just, she kind of looked resigned. It was very weird. And I thought... 
my God, she's scared right now. It kind of shocked Karen and I, I think, the level of empathy we felt for her because I don't think at the end of the day, I mean, she acknowledged how complicated the site is, but I don't think she wants people to feel the way they feel towards EPA. I definitely think she wants her agency to succeed, but it's not. And I think I just, in her face, she couldn't figure out why. And she looks kind of stumped, and it's like she was reaching out to us to help. So when we sat down, just at a normal table with her, it was hard because you wanted to be nice, but at the same time, we wanted to be strong. And so we chose somewhere in between. We thanked her for meeting, and I just told her, I understand we have 20 minutes. I said, we wanted to meet with you last year, and now we have even more to talk about since, you know, you waited a year to see us. I said, so we're going to fill that entire 20 minutes. I said, and we ask that you be respectful because we've been waiting a long time to talk with you. And she nodded, Mm -hmm. and then we just went into it. And we told her, we said, we're not going to talk about mistakes at this site or soil or pico curies or uranium and thorium. And I told her, I said, you guys have made mistakes at this site, severe ones. And those have consequences. I said, and that's not even up for debate. That is what it is. And she nodded like she agreed. And I continued. I said, it's the people that are going to suffer the consequences. I said, so we're here to talk to you about the people, what their lives are like and how they've been impacted by this site. And we just went into it from there. How did she take it? She seemed very empathetic. At one point, the only thing that rubbed us the wrong way, she shot back and she said, well, I don't know if the law allows. And I, I just kind of cut her off. I said, Section 101.24 of your circular relocation law. I said, we already qualify for relocation under your own law. It's not a matter whether you can do it legally. I said, it's a matter of whether you will do it politically. And I said, either way, those people living the closest to this site have to be relocated. They wanted to steer it. How was this left? And what kind of follow-up, if any, is there supposed to be? And what timeline? Because I understand that there's a timeline that you told her. Yes, we told her at the end of the meeting. We ended the meeting. The meeting could have gone a lot longer, but we ended it because we felt like we had made our point. And I'm not going to keep her. And frankly, it's not my life's desire to even sit in front of her. I mean, I just, the more we sat there, the more disgusted we were, not with her per se, but with the fact that you're sitting in front of somebody, Libby, that has the ability to snap their fingers and make your family okay. And it became so obvious towards the end of the conversation that we're not fighting science here. This is not a scientific battle. This is not, let's find another document that shows this or that. This is a political battle being fought. And that became more evident, and it just was hard. You know what I'm saying? It was hard not to beg and plead, and we tried not to go there. But we left it with, we'd like to hear back about the option of a buyout within two weeks. We'd like to hear something from her. And she nodded, and she said, I think that that's a reasonable time frame. She asked us what caught us a little bit off guard. She said, I know you're frustrated. She said, but please do not shy away from the engagement process at this site. That caught us off guard because I looked at her and I said, do you realize that every meeting we go to, whether it's hosted by you or whoever, is time away from our kids that will never get back? I said, and that's bureaucracy. I said, we already lose a lot by even living next to this site. And then to ask us to stay engaged, I said, that's a very difficult thing to ask when the response to our engagement hasn't been so good. And what was her response to that? No, she nodded. She wanted to know who was misbehaving at Region 7. That was the other card she threw out there. And Karen and I kind of looked at each other like, okay, she wants to know. I don't know if she wants to really know who's doing something wrong so she can fix it or if she's looking for a scapegoat. But either way, you know, we could give her a list of ridiculous things that many of her staff have said, Matthew Stanislaus being one of them on the phone. I thought, or we could take the other road and we could point out a few of the staff that have actually done good things. So we chose that one. And we called out the the new project manager, and I told her, I said, you have good employees, people who want to do the right thing, who are very vocal about what the right thing should be. I said, and then they make it clear that it's not a matter of them wanting to do it. It's a matter of them being allowed to do it. And that really got her attention. 
I said, you have good people. I said, and you need to listen to them. So at the end of this two-week period, which I believe will be coming up within a few days, what is the planned or expected follow-up? Are you supposed to get a call from her? Are you supposed to call her and hear back? Are you actually expecting there to be a continuation of the communication at that time? Oh, I expect that there will be absolutely. You know, she she told us there would be, and she tweeted us out, thanks for meeting with me, and she looks forward to it in the future. We're going to hold her at her word. We're trying to hold out faith. You know, I, I it's frustrating but we're trying to hold out that give her the opportunity to do the correct thing. And I don't think that there's any question of whether or not it's the correct thing. Again, it's, it's political will. Will she be allowed? Will she take that step that's politically going to be difficult for her? That's the question. And so we could sit back and wait. We've talked about it. I think we have this conversation in high school don't we, with our boyfriends. Do we call them? Or do we wait for them to call us? And I think that we'll probably call her. Because let's just see how receptive they are when we call back. That sounds prudent and an appropriate plan. And what I find interesting is that you also met with the White House, the bosses of the EPA. What was that meeting like? Who attended and how did it go? I would say both meetings went really well and we were we left surprised. That meeting, well, first of all, let me just say that I had never even seen the White House. So to walk up to a building on the corner of the White House was kind of freaked us out because I don't think people understand this. I mean, Karen and I, it was like the weight of the world, Libby. When we went into these meetings, it was like one mistake and our friends don't get help. That is a lot for two moms to have to carry. And it felt very unfair and it was very emotional because we just kept thinking of our friends, our people that live, the people on our page, thinking, you know, we got to nail this. You don't get a redo at this type of thing. But I felt like we did. I felt like we stayed true to who we are. We are just moms. And we brought the mom perspective to the table. We let Ed Smith, the Coalition for the Environment, talk about the science and the data and food wrap. You know, Lois talked about the bureaucracy. We let the Teamsters talk about their workers and their concerns, which was a very brief little segment. But I think because we're just moms walking in, I felt like we were really welcomed. I felt like they really appreciated at the White House that we were staying true. We looked wrinkled and disheveled and a mess. And we looked like two housewives walking into a conference room. You looked like two moms walking into a conference room. We did, with runs in our stockings trying to find clear nail polish so they don't run even further. I mean, it just, it's funny, but it's not. That is literally who we are. And when they walked in the room, there were three guys, there ended up being four, that wanted to sit. They all had different roles within the Council for Environmental Quality. You know, one played more of a legislative role, one was a stakeholder role, you know what I'm saying? So they had everybody lined up on theirs so that, they would be able to understand what was happening. But they walked in and they said, well, I understand that you had a meeting with EPA and Gina McCarthy. So they had already known about it. So that was either a phone call from EPA. It wasn't a phone call from us. So it's kind of like EPA had called them ahead of time and been like, okay, okay, we met with them. We met with them. We did it. We did it. We did it. You know, don't Mm -hmm. hit us. (laughs) And I just, we look at each other and we're like, oh my gosh. I mean, what is that like? That's like what? Kids running up to them, Mom, Mom, we cleaned our room. We cleaned our room. Don't tell Dad. Don't crown us. It's clean. Look. Never mind the fight that ensued all day long, right, to get the kids' room cleaned. We just looked at each other and laughed. So given that all this mom energy was going on and all of this truth was being spoken, how was it left with the White House? And what follow-up is there going to take place with them? Well, first of all, in the meetings that we've had with people, when we're trying to convey everything that's happening at this site, which is a lot, it's a lot to take in, usually people sit there and they're very quiet. They're processing it. We could tell that the Council for Environmental Quality had done a little bit of research. Not a lot, but a little. Enough, I should say. And as we were showing them photos, 
So photos of the brush fire that everybody's seen on the Internet, photos of the well that caught on fire with the big smoke plume. I mean, they were just, in fact, one of them sat back when he saw the brush fire photo. One of the guys, he goes, oh, shit. I mean, you know, and so we kind of looked at each other. I mean, they were changing colors practically. And at the end of the meeting, the one guy sat back and looked at all of us, and he said this was an incredible stakeholders meeting. You brought everybody to the table here. We had the attorney general's office represented. He said, you did a nice job because you each took the piece that belonged to you and gave them the complete story that way. And he, and he acknowledged that. He said, that was just, I mean, this was one of the most incredible meetings. Great job with the stakeholders. And he said, I can't believe that we haven't heard of this site. Really? So that so, kind of got me. So they are claiming that the White House did not know about what's happening at this site in North St. Louis? I don't know if he's claiming the White House or if he's claiming that they, as in the Council for Environmental Quality, had not been engaged earlier. I don't know what that meant, and I've kind of gone, just like you did, I kind of go back and forth playing that back, saying, what the heck did that mean? But either way, that meant a lot to us because, again, you know, you've got EPA saying, this isn't a big deal, this isn't a big deal. Then you've got Gina McCarthy saying, oh, this is our most complicated Superfund site in the nation. When you get in front of these people and they're hearing this for the first time or they've done very little research, there is a part of us that honestly hopes this site isn't as bad as we think it is and as we know it is. We're waiting for somebody to say, guys, I know you're scared, but it's really not that bad. There is nobody, Weeby, who looks at this stuff that says that and that feels that way. It's always validation, but it's validation is the worst thing for us because we have to go back home to it. Karen and I just looked at each other. We sat across the table, and, I mean, it was almost a moment where we wanted to just cry. I mean, it was just like, you know, once again, we're in front of people that go and brief the president. You want to just literally get on your knees and wrap your arms around their legs and say, save us, save my kids, do something. You want to beg. It's incredible. And it was scary, too, because when we left that meeting, we felt like Karen and I, I said, I said, what, what, and I even asked Lois, I said, what could we have done differently? And she said, nothing. She said, you did everything. That meeting went, she said it was almost divine intervention. She said it, it went better than anything we could have hoped for, anything we practiced for. And she said it. She said, you know, if nothing comes of this, moms, it's not because you didn't try. And <laughs> sorry. That, we needed to hear that because I need these people to understand on the page. There's a lot of ridiculousness happening on the page right now. I'm sure you're reading and seeing it. We're trying, Weedy. We're doing everything we can. That, we are doing everything we can to get these people help. That is so clear to me, so clear in the stories that we've been able to carry here on Nuclear Hot Seat. And... Any criticism that may be coming down is just by people who don't understand exactly how complex this can be and how difficult it is to even get to people in power, let alone have the strength, the fortitude, the will, and the information to be able to speak truth to that power in a way that lands. No, I mean, right now we're being criticized because the new off-site data came out. Well, it's not new. You knew this. This isn't new data. We've known. We've been having monthly meetings, putting the diagrams up. Suddenly, when EPA says, okay, it's off-site, and we have this, suddenly the news picks it up. We've got people criticizing us, like, why didn't you put this up? We're trying. We are hosting monthly meetings. We are reading 1,000-page documents, trying to interpret them, trying to pull out the important parts. It is exhausting, and I wish these people could understand that even on the face of the people at the White House who hear situations like this a lot, it's exhausting. I mean, they looked exhausted at the end of an hour-long meeting. Such a complex site. There's so much stuff going on. There's so many agencies that have dropped the ball. At the end of the day, their main focus, and they said this, is not to point fingers, but to figure out what are we going to do about it. Point fingers 20 years from now when they have a solution at this site, we're all safe. Then go back and read these documents and say who did what. 
See, the time right now is not for conspiracy theories. The time right now is to prevent this fire from hitting this radioactive waste. So and that's what we are faced with. So instead of coming at you with criticism, what can people do to turn it around and help with this incredible amount of work and communication and everything else that is needed to start gaining the relief that is so richly deserved and necessary to those people who are living within proximity of the landfill and the fire, to say nothing of the entire country, which is all going to be downwinders, should that fire hit the radioactive waste. Honestly, I think the first thing people can do if they really want to support us, we appreciate you on our Facebook pages, but you need to either attend these public monthly meetings, or if you can't and it's like you, please pick up the phone and call us. There is so much going on at this site. There is so much that happens every day, so much with these meetings that we cannot even possibly fit in a Facebook post. And we are willing to talk to you on the phone. Do not assume Just Moms STL is a tiny little, we are just moms. We do not have the money to pay for people to do off-site testing. We couldn't do that if we wanted to. Right now, we are trying to get this in front of people who can fix it or get these people safe, really both. Be a part of that process. I think social media, it's a very interesting conversation, Levy, that we have with Lois Gibbs. You know, when Lois Gibbs was doing Love Canal, there was no social media. Mm -hmm. It was all neighborhood meetings, right, and moms sitting in the front room having coffee, I mean, even just meeting you when Dr. Caldecott came in, when you meet and sit with somebody face-to-face, it's different. You understand, and they can pour their heart out. I know that not everybody has that opportunity and phones the best. Social media is the worst place to try and get a feel on what's really happening. But it's our only option that we have right now. That's why we record these meetings so people can watch it. We need everybody helping We need much less criticism right now. I am frustrated with EPA. I was very frustrated with Gina McCarthy. People were like, go in there and give her hell. Don't soft pedal. You know what? We had a 20-minute meeting with her, and we needed to get people safe. I could have spent an hour screaming at this woman. I really could have, and she probably would have deserved it. But it wouldn't have gotten these people the help that they need. That's right. It wouldn't have. Communication is always a better step because while it might feel good in the short term to have an emotional explosion, in the long term you will not see the results that you want and if nothing else, the lack of willingness to follow through on what you need followed through on will be hardened so it will be that much harder. So to my perspective, What you and Karen decided to do in that 20-minute meeting was absolutely the right tactic to take because you can't go backwards. You can only go forwards, and that's where you need to put the attention and the traction. I mean, we set up till it was probably 2 o'clock in the morning at Lois's house, and she took turns playing Gina, and she was nice. And she was mean. And we role played. We actually role played in her living room. It was crazy because at one point she threw something at me and was angry and I got angry right back and I almost I forgot it was Lois playing, you know? <laughs> that this was a role play because you are so emotional and you want to get this right. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I just kinda hollered in your front room and she said, That was great. <laughs> that was great. And I'm, I mean, I don't know what Gina's gonna do. The ball is in her court, though. She has the opportunity to do the right thing. And I'd like to give her the opportunity to. We gave her two weeks. We're going to go to her and say what's going on. If they choose not to, well, then let it be said. We gave them the opportunity to do the right thing, and they chose not to. And then you can choose another course of action. Absolutely. And then we still have to follow up with the White House. So we still have to follow up really next week with CEQ. And that's what we tell them. I mean, they were very interested in how our meeting with Gina went, and we laid it out just like we, you know, I was just talking to you. 
I mean, we told him and we said, we gave her the opportunity to do what she needed to do and what she could do and legally has the authority to do. And we told him, we said, it's very hard right now. We've been hurt. We're sick. We're scared. This is, I think, when we got, I think Karen did this and got very emotional, but it was appropriate. She said, we just want somebody to help us. We're not interested in who did what, pointing fingers. Let people do that 20 years from now. We will, of course, stay in touch with you and with Karen to find out what's happening. And as soon as you hear back from either Gina or the CEQ, please let us know. And we will, of course, feature that information front and center on Nuclear Hot Seat. Well, we appreciate that, and we absolutely will, and we just appreciate you so much for giving us a voice, and we appreciate what you've been through in your experience and your willingness to share that with us. It's good to feel right now that we're not alone in these experiences. You are not alone. There is a national, if not an international, community that is on your side with this, and certainly I will do everything in my power to help you get the information out as it's available. So, You hear anything from D.C., shoot me an email, message me on Facebook, give me a call, whatever it takes, and we will continue to cover the story of the moms, the just moms, as in the justice-bearing mothers of of North St. Louis. Dawn Chapman, once again, thank you so much for being my guest this week on Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you, Libby. That was Dawn Chapman of Just Moms STL and the Westlake Landfill page on Facebook. If you wish to donate to Just Moms so that they don't have to sweat a hotel room in a cab for any future necessary trips or actions, go to justmomsstl.org. There are two S's in that one right next to the other. Activist shout out. The good folks at Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network, or FAN, have a great new petition up promoting awareness of currently scheduled radioactive atrocities at the Tokyo 2020 Summer Olympics and Paralympics, both of which have events scheduled to take place in Fukushima. The petition is addressed to Ban Ki-moon, Secretary General of the UN, U.S. Ambassador to Japan Carolyn Kennedy, the International Olympic Committee, you know, right, like they'll listen, the International Paralympic Committee, and it's a good bet that they will listen, President Obama, First Lady Michelle Obama, Senator Bernie Sanders, UNICEF, and the World Health Organization. We will have a link to that petition up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 251. A reminder for the movie-loving activists in our midst, if you happen to be in Los Angeles on Wednesday, April 27, you must, must, must attend the International Uranium Film Festival. It's making a one-day stop in La La Land to screen movies starting at 2 p.m. in Hollywood in a real Hollywood studio. Featured films are the Marshall Islands documentary, Nuclear Savage, which was originally commissioned by PBS's Frontline and then rejected for reasons you'll understand once you view it. That will be followed by the German drama Final Picture about attempts at survival after nuclear war in Europe. This film has already won several awards and the director as well as the lead actress will be in attendance. At 7.30, the featured film, the international award-winning The Man Who Saved the World, which includes a cameo by Kevin Costner. It's the chilling story of how a young Soviet soldier defies his command and resists pushing the button on a nuclear launch when all the computers say Russia is under attack by the United States. A chilling story made all the more frightening by the fact that it is absolutely true and that the person playing the soldier in the story is the actual soldier. And don't forget, we will have a red carpet at 6.30, and then after The Man Who Saved the World, a nuclear power panel, having the inimitable and extremely powerful Harvey Wasserman, Emilio Estevez, myself, and others. Come join us, be glamorous, be righteous, do some networking, and see what filmmakers from around the world are saying about the nuclear issue in documentaries and dramas. Here's the great part. 
Tickets are free, but you must reserve your space. We will have a link to do that up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 251. And my apologies. Last week, I told you about a video promo for an animation from Fukushima about the events of 3.11.11, featuring the voices of local residents for all the characters. I said I would put a link up on the website last week, and then it plumb slipped my mind. So it will be up there as well as on this week's episode for you to take a look at. I believe you will find it as moving as I did. Here's today's final thought. I'm still recovering from a cold, in case you couldn't tell it from my voice, and my brain's still stuffed up as well. So no thoughts this week, final or otherwise. In closing, this has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, April 12, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, Arurang, CCTV, Iori Mochizuki and Fukushima Diary.com, Deunrenard WordPress.com, Counterpunch.org, ABCnews.go.com, KPFA, Fairwinds.org, Mirror.co.uk, STLToday.com, Examiner.com, and Byron Delir, CurrentArgus.com, Santa Fe, New Mexico.com, Erica Gray, TimesFreePress.com, NOLA.com, DenverPost.com, PressAndJournal.co.uk, TheLocal.fr, DW.com, TheGuardian.com, OttawaCitizen.com, The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the marvelous activists who gather and swap tips on the Nuclear Hot Seat site on Facebook, which you are all invited to visit and like. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV, on StuWebRadioNetwork.com, in New Zealand by NewZSentinel.com, and ActivateMedia.org. We are always looking for other networks to connect with, so if you know of a news aggregator, community radio station, cable station, satellite station, or eh, I'll take broadcast too. If any of them would like to carry the show, please put us in touch. You can check out our archive of over 250, that's 250 shows, on the website NuclearHotSeat.com. We also have a lot of those shows up on the YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, courtesy both Ms. Milky the Clown and Joni Ray. And what the heck, you can check us out on iTunes as well, where we are listed under podcasts. A reminder that if you sign up on the website for the free chapter from my ebook, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond, it will put you on our database and you will receive notice of Nuclear Hot Seat via email every week. It's the easiest way to keep track of our episodes and keep up to date on the show. And a reminder that your contributions help keep Nuclear Hot Seat the vital force it is for honest, accurate nuclear news. So please, do what you can this week to help us out with a donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now do not hit that snooze button and go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat, it's the bomb.